Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I am joined by my fantastic co host, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. I'm running out of uh, different words to explain how they are. Uh, and today we are joined and are interviewing uh, Colin Harper, uh, head of content and research at Luxatech and ex Bitcoin magazine and Coindesk writer. Uh, how's it going today, man? How are you doing? Doing well, Lawrence. Uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, always love chatting with you guys. Awesome, and uh, same here. Glad to glad to have you. Uh, as as you will uh, know, as a as a journalist, uh, I you know I'm here for the hard hitting, serious questions. So for the first question, I want to ask you. This is one that I know all of our listeners will be desperate to to know the answer to. Uh, what is your hair routine? <laughs> oh man, just absolutely putting me on blast immediately. You expect nothing less from a bloke from the UK, eh? um so uh yeah i mean you know just uh shampoo conditioner uh you know make sure only do it a few times a day or a few times a week uh make sure comb it every single time that you condition it uh my fiance has been invaluable for this i had like terrible hair uh care before i started dating her and, like i still had the long hair too right so like unless i was like you know i don't know sometimes it was a little nappy and stuff like that but I was also living in Tennessee back then. You kind of get away with it because there's so much humidity. My hair would just like blow up in the summers. But yeah, it's um yeah, that's no, cool. I mean, as someone who's growing my hair out as well, you know, I just uh, I noticed the 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 flowing locks when we were in El Salvador. So uh, had to you know drop the question. So you heard it here first, everyone. Um, this is Colin's hair routine, uh, world exclusive. Uh, but yeah, beyond uh, beyond that uh, question, I'll, I'll move on. What I guess something that we, we had a Twitter Spaces probably I don't know last year at some point back when I liked Twitter Spaces. Um, <laughs> so for anyone who's, who listened to that, it might be covering old ground a little bit. But I wanted to, for the sake of people listening, uh, it'd, it'd be good to understand uh, like your background. So like the, the the easy question to ask here is like, how did you get into how did you get into Bitcoin? And you could be quick about it, obviously because I know it's probably something you've explained quite a few times now but how did you get into bitcoin and like how did you find yourself kind of getting into writing like bitcoin and crypto journalism yeah so i'll try to be quick with it um but i had always known what bitcoin was strangely enough um like my friend from high school like the year it came out was trying to explain to me how mining worked um i was in high, i was a fucking freshman like no concept of uh, what any of this stuff was, didn't care about what money was, you know, just had no cares in the world, right? Just had, didn't, didn't care about it. Uh, knew, knew that some buddies uh, bought drugs uh, on the dark web with it in college. Um, so like always like come popping back up in my life in some ways. And so like, there's always this like realizations like this thing's never gone away. And I don't really understand what it is. I just know that it's money that's on the internet and not tied to anything else. Um, and then I got out of school in 2017 I graduated I was an English literature major I was trying to figure out what to do trying to figure out if I wanted to teach go back to school if I wanted to write edit something if I wanted to do journalism um, and then uh, I was scrolling Facebook one day and this random dude like posted this absolutely fr like frantic frenetic post where it's like you could earn x amount of dollars like 100 200 300 dollars a day by mining bitcoin and altcoins and um, I uh, was like, oh, like shit. It was the first time I'd seen like real money really kind of associated with it outside of like vague prices that tend to be back in the day, right? Like one Bitcoin, $300 when they were like buying drugs off, the silk, uh, off one of the Silk Road uh, spinoffs. So I looked into it um, and I saw all these altcoins and all of this shit. And I just absolutely got sucked into the candy store. It was like bought all the crap. Um, I started writing for some um, some websites that would do like, you know, just like reviews of wallets or guides and just general crypto stuff. I, I didn't know anything. Um, <laughs> I didn't know anything. And I met the Bitcoin Magazine folks at a conference. They had an office in Nashville. I was living in Nashville at the time. And one thing led to another. I got a job there and just kind of just kept writing about it. And that's when really, like a really Bitcoin kind of made more sense to me than other things. Like I really started actually looking into the applications, how people were using it, what it's for, what it does. Um, and uh, ironically, this is the last thing I'll say about it. Like mining was the thing that su sucked me back in kind of when I saw that post on Facebook from this random dude and this like, you know, Discord, you know, this, um, uh, uh, this like you know, marketplace page. And now I'm working for a mining company um, and 
mining was always something that was fascinating to me, but it was never accessible back in the day. So something that you kind of involved in from early on, and then you found yourself working working more into it as you kind of, yeah, you said met back Bitcoin magazine guys and you got more involved in shit coins, et cetera, at the beginning and then kind of worked your way up. Um, so I suppose it, it sounds like from what you said that you were uh, getting a little bit like uh, tired, potentially tired, of, a little bit tired of it or a little bit kind of, I don't know, uh, sick of it until you then kind of had the opportunity to then go more into mining is that right i I don't want to be putting words in your mouth um no i think that just like um what i would say is like i don't think i really fully understood what the point of a blockchain was until i started working at bitcoin magazine right like i don't think like um the the whole like i would read early on um about like the double spinning problem or you know things like that and it just you know i think this is true for a lot of people in like privileged financial uh economies it's like it doesn't it's like, what do you mean? Like, so the money, like I, like I can spend the money without anyone telling me I can't, and that like no one can, um, you know, inflate the money supply, and no one can make fraudulent, uh, you know, Bitcoin. Uh, it, it to me, it was like, okay, like that's all right, I guess, but I don't really, you know, like that doesn't make that doesn't matter for me. I just want to make money, right? Um, and so uh, when I started working at Bitcoin Magazine, started working with Anna Van Weerdom, started reporting on some of the use cases. It was like, oh, I see. This is money for a completely uh, uh, th- this. This is money for a new paradigm for how we exchange value and how we view holding value and how we view how you can custody that value and move it around in an age with uh, you know uh, internet infrastructure everywhere. So, um, I, uh, I I was getting sick of. I think what you might have also been referring to um, when, in our space is I was getting tired of journalism. Um, I was getting tired of crypto journalism because I think that there's this problem and um, this is just journalism at large, but it, it especially is um, a, a problem for a cryptocurrency because it's such an abstruse topic and so hard for people to understand. So it's much easier to just go for the pulp. Um, so uh, I, I got tired of having to report on things that were just keyword, uh, you know, cows. This is like kind of what I guess I would call them. It's just like, fat, you know, articles with just fat keywords that are going to get searched a bunch in Google, like Dogecoin's a perfect example. And so um, some of the, my, some of the days when I was doing that, I'd love it. You know, I'd be writing stuff that really actually was breaking news and advancing conversations on things that I felt like mattered. Um, and then there were other days where it's like, hey, Colin, you need to write this article about Dogecoin. And it's like, I don't, that just doesn't, it doesn't like that's the kind of shit that I did in 2018 when I in 2017 when I didn't understand any of this stuff. Like I don't want to do that anymore. Um, I wanted to be more industry facing, so I went mining. Sorry, kind of rambling, making it a little more about me. But um, anyway, oh, that that answers the question, man. Like perfectly, because I, I yeah, I was kind of hinting at both periods, but that definitely was one of the things. Because I remember, yeah, when we spoke, I remember there was a slight sort of slight hint of like, oh, kind of a little bit sick of <laughs> sick of this kind of thing, and. Yeah. Um, and I remember, um, and, and I suppose it, I think it's not a surprise either, because if you do something for a long time, especially if it's writing about something you're not necessarily passionate about some of the time, then you're going to get pretty bored of it. And I even though like for myself, I've had to take like a month or so off Twitter before and like, you know, take breaks from checking prices and things like that. Cause I just get, sometimes I get a bit sick of it. Mm-hmm. Like I'll get super, super, super into things. I'll be making a lightning ATM. I'll be doing this, going to this meetup. And then I start thinking like, geez, like I'm kind of sick of talking about Bitcoin now. Like this, <laughs> like yeah, I kind of get, get really fed up with it. <laughs> you get sucked into this bubble, right? Like it's its own, it's its own world, it's its own microcosm. Um, and I think that it's something to that Bitcoiners need to remember, right? It's like we need to be careful not to be too dogmatic. Um, I know that usually a lot of Bitcoiners are very principled and they are very, um, you know, they have a sense of a mission and they feel like something needs to be done. Um, but sometimes I think you can get a little too tribal, just like with everything. I mean, uh, we see this and everything else. I think human beings scramble for meaning in their lives and they attach to certain externalities, like whether it be politics, religion, uh, some sort of lifestyle. And I think Bitcoin is like that too. So it's good to kind of like kind of step out and have that perspective every now and again, because I totally agree with you. Like there have been times where it's just like, I was like so deep in it and it's just like, talking about it all the time with my friends and family and they're just like dude shut up <laughs> like we don't care you know it's like it's sometimes you feel like the messiah on the hill you know being like like you're all gonna fucking lose your money unless you adopt this thing you know and you know we don't know that ultimately i mean we think that but um 
yeah, I uh, I love I love the Bitcoin community though. I've never had the I was thinking about this uh, the other day. You know, um, the internet really opened up the potential for people to communicate all around the world. I mean, like with 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 my Bitcoin magazine job, I'd be talking to people from all around the world all the time, and the internet makes that possible uh, through email and instant messaging. And what a beautiful thing to have Bitcoin, right? Now we have the monetary side of that, right? Like we had like the actual like information side with the internet and now we have the monetary side. Um, and I think it's very um, fitting that Bitcoin's community is so global. I mean, look at like who we have on this call right now, right? Um, we've got people representing, I assume, I mean, people from um, four different continents, right? Like that's, that's, that's yeah. a pretty special thing. You don't really see that very often. I feel like in many industries, um, I mean, you do in big, big multinational and global ones, but like every small company in Bitcoin has like at least two nationalities represented, right? Um, I was super anxious to hear about the mining industry. Um, I also worked as a journalist and I'm super curious about mining and you've kind of transitioned into that full time. So I'd love to get your take on it. Yeah, is there any like a uh, topic is there a lot of different angles? Is there anything like specifically you were thinking well, about? Well, um, we, we interviewed um, Econo Alchemist on Twitter, uh, Burn the Bridge, about mm -hmm. home mining. And he kind of mm -hmm. gave us a glimpse into people mining at home and, and decentralizing the network and, and self custodying your Bitcoin and stuff. We talked to Charlie Schumacher from Marathon, which is like publicly yeah, traded mining, huge, large yeah, scale right. enterprise. Just like total in other ends of the spectrum, right? I think that's yeah. really an interesting, um, so maybe I'll just riff on that for a second. I mean, I think that's really an interesting dichotomy, right? Like, so at Luxor, the company that I work at, we've devised a metric called hash price. Um, and that's a way to measure value of your computing power, your hash rate for Bitcoin, right? So it's like, um, you measure it and you can measure it in dollars or sats and you basically take a Terra hash, which is, a, you know, like a S19, one of the newest miners, just for our listeners, produces 100 Terra hash. So if the hash price is 16 cents per Terra hash, which is as today, you could expect to make like $16 in revenue for that machine um, over the course of a day. Um, if you're mining with like a, um, with, with, with a mining pool. So it's with specific mining pools like Luxor that do FPPS. Um, but uh, so uh, before like the last bull market, like hash price was like dirt cheap. It was like six, six, seven cents, like right before Bitcoin kicked off in 2020. Um, and last year it tapped out at like 41 cents, which is like, so people were just absolutely crushing it. Home mining was back in fashion. Um, and it was also compounded by the fact that you had China banning mining, right? So you had all of these machines. Um, the mining industry has historically been concentrated in China like on, on I, pretty much every vertical, um, except really the financial. Like that's one place that the United States has excelled in, in, in creating financial infrastructure for cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. Um, early on, um, China had mining pools, the manufacturing for ASICs, um, bunch of power, all this stuff. So they kind of had that market cornered. Um, it's harder for North American companies to get ASICs. Um, the Chinese and Asian partners would always get preferential treatment. Um, and then China bans mining, and then all these machines come over to the United States. So you started seeing a lot of people like as, with more interest in Bitcoin. Like, as Bitcoin went through this kind of like hype cycle again, more people came in. And I, I would run spaces, and there would be a lot of people who were totally new to Bitcoin, but they were mining with like Compass, or they were like buying machines for their house. And that was not really a thing that people did last cycle. Like, I, I mean, some did for sure. Some people tried and thought about doing it, but it was too hard logistically. Like there was no way for them to get machines um, unless they really knew someone. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, I, I'm a, what I'm a little worried about is like, so now you have hash price dropping, like it went from like 40 cents to now it's at like 16 or 17 cents. So like mining profitability is getting squeezed really hard right now. Um, most home miners, unless they have new generation machines, you're not going to be breaking it even unless they have super cheap power. Um, you're going to really have to know what you're doing. I think a lot of people probably dove into it last year and they don't really probably have not thought that much about the economics of it or like mining is extremely complicated. Like it's not as simple as just buying the machine and plugging it in. Like you got to make sure your house is wired. You got to make sure that you have, um, airflow or something to make sure the miner doesn't get overheated. You gotta make sure that you're doing something to expel the waste heat. You gotta make sure that you're keeping the miner like uh, dust free and free from things that would clog up the fans. 
Um, and you got all these big pub companies that are coming in and they're going to start turning on just thousands of machines. So Bitcoin's hash rate's probably gonna hit like, it's like at 210 exahashes right now. Um, it's probably gonna hit somewhere like 300, 320 by the end of this year. Um, that's like, I would say like 280 is conservative, 330 would be um, liberal and somewhere in the middle of that. And so once that happens, unless Bitcoin's price keeps up, um, it's going to be not. It's going to be um, extremely uh, difficult for people with higher electricity prices to keep their machines on, because the more Bitcoin's hash rate goes up, the more difficulty goes up, the less you're making per block reward for the unit of energy you're putting in. So um, I guess my take on mining right now, it's been an extremely exciting year after the China ban. Um, the United States and North America and and Latin America too. Like Latin America is really starting to see some some investment and growth in mining. Um, just like the, 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 the Western hemisphere is having this kind of like renaissance with the mining industry. And it's really, really great. Um, I just hope that Bitcoin's price can, will keep up with uh, some of the hash rate growth because if not, then it's um, a lot of people and they're gonna get burned and it's gonna leave some sour taste in some investors' mouths. Mm -hmm.